Okay, so good morning, everyone. And this is actually class 20 in the book called Touching a City Soul, which, uh, as we've been learning, is a compilation of the of the classes, or I should say the sikhas, the maimarim, the meetings that the previous rabbi had with different groups of people while he was visiting Chicago in 1942. In the original um, printing in Hebrew and Yiddish, it was called Beaker Chicago, which means a visit to Chicago. Um, and we're on page 96 of the, of the book. And this is actually a, uh, I guess, a, I don't know, a transcript, I'm not sure, of the Rebbe's talk with the group of Rabbanim called Merkos HaRabbanim in Chicago um, concerning the state of Yiddishkeit in Chicago. This is actually very short. So it's, I, I think we'll, I imagine that we're going to finish it and actually start the, sec the, next, the next section, which is the, the Mimer, um, the next Mimer. So this should, I really think this should just take a few minutes, even though I'm constantly surprised <laughs> um, by how much discussion some things can cause. But I think this is this won't cause the whole class. I don't know. We'll see. But I'm willing to be surprised. So this is Monday evening, the eve of the 9th of Shvat in Chicago, uh, 1942. So again, this is a group of Rabbanim Mer called Merkos HaRabbanim who are visiting the Rebbe. Um, and he's talking to them about the state of Yiddishkeit in Chicago. And he's going to have some very um, strong opinions, which I'm sure won't come as a surprise to anybody who's been following this book so far. <laughs> yeah, you have a question? Yeah. Why is he referred to as the previous Rebbe? Why not using, why don't, so often, why not using his name? Why don't people use his name more? Um, I guess because during during the Rebbe's, during our Rebbe's um, lifetime, he was always, he was usually called the previous Rebbe. So he, that name just stuck. I'm saying just that's how he became known. It's like the Alter Rebbe became known as the Alter Rebbe and the Mitzel Rebbe became known as the Mitzel Rebbe, even though they also had names because those names became sort of active in the lifetime of the Tzemach Tzedek, who was the third Lubavitch Rebbe. So the first one was called like the grandfather and then the middle one, because there was the third one. So even though this is seven generations later, we still call him Baal Rebbe, the Mitzel Rebbe, even though the second Rebbe is no longer the middle Rebbe because we're, we're not in the lifetime of the third Rebbe, right? But th those names just kind of stuck. So uh, I don't I don't know why these names stuck. Out. But in Eretz Yisrael, they call, they call the Rebbe the Rebbe Rayat. The, the Friedrich Rebbe is called the Rebbe Rayat in Eretz Yisrael, which is the acronym in Hebrew for his name, like the Rebbe Rashab and the Rebbe Marash are all acronyms for their names. It, it, so um, the right, you might hear somebody call the Friedrich Rebbe the Rebbe Rayat, and that, that is referring to him by his name, Rebbe Yosef Yitzchak. So, yeah. Okay, so on page, um, I guess on page 96, so it was 12 years ago, remember during my first, or during my visit with you in Chicago, I remember this is the second time that the, that the previous ever came to Chicago. He had come earlier, so he's um, During my visit with you in Chicago, I told you that I had come not only to take money for our brethren in Europe, but also to give. For that has been my life's mission throughout the years of work in the cause of, in the cause of God-fearing Torah study and kosher schooling. So, um, he, the the previous as we know from other classes, information about his life and so on, is that he, a, a, a very large push of his uh, was education, Jewish education, especially for children, because as he said, if there's no education for children, then there's no adults. <laughs> you know, they in order to grow the next generation. This, the young generation needs to be educated uh, properly. And he gave really had a, quite a bit of Masir Snefesh in Russia and then later on in America um, for Jewish education in general and specifically for Jewish education of, of children. Um, so he's he came to take money, rates of fundraise for the Jews in Europe when he had come 12 years earlier and also to give. 
Um, and now divine providence has made me hit the road from country to country, all the way to America. So he's referring to the very long sort of circuitous route that he took out of Russia, Latvia, Poland, you know, it, to, on his way to America, um, through basically through very difficult times of World War II. Um, by man, by God, are a man's steps made firm with a specific mission for the above causes. Um, he, he's stating that this route that he took and the fact that he wound up in America is because Hashem has decided that he should be here. And therefore, um, he's calling up by God, our man's steps made firm. And as Hashem directed his steps to, to where he is today, which is true of everybody, right? And an emissary is obligated to fill his divinely ordained mission with self-sacrifice under all circumstances. So he felt um, he was sort of sworn in by his father to help the Jewish nation at a very young age. And he took that responsibility, that oath that he made with his father, I think at the grave of his grandfather in a very, very strong way. And now he's saying that, that he's an emissary, it's because it, he was made into an emissary um, and he has to fulfill his mission with self-sacrifice. Um, and adding under all circumstances, what is all circumstances, whether it's under under the czar, when the beginning of his lifetime there was under czarist rule, under communist rule, um, whether it's under the war, in, under the Nazi rule, when he was, you know, under the Nazis control in the Warsaw Ghetto and everything else, like, no matter who is in charge, um, and even, as we spoke about before, and even in America, right, which is not the same type of Messir Snefesh, as is needed under such ty tyranny, but it's a different kind of Messias Nefesh, right? Because America presents a different type of allure and a different type of um, challenge to serving Hashem. So whatever the circumstance is, Torah and its messages are eternal. The service of Hashem is eternal in all places, in all time, under all circumstances. And he's saying his uh, an emissary has to have has to have self-sacrifice under all circumstances at all times as well. I arrived in America, like all the Rabbanim who have now arrived in America, not because we earned and deserve the privilege of having God save us from the tyrant's bloodstained hands. Rather, God dispatched us here with a dual mission. Not, number one, a mission to American Jewry, and number two, to the Rabbanim and lay leaders. In other words, he, he's viewing the fact that he was saved from the tyrant's bloodstained hands, I imagine he's referring to Hitler, um, at that time, right? There were other tyrant's bloodstained hands that he was also saved from earlier in his life, but at that moment he was saved from from, from Hitler, Yamashimai. So he's saying it's not because of any great merit, and it's such a humble statement, right? It's not because of any great merit, but it's because we have to do something. There's a very, I'm gonna share a very interesting story it's one of my favorite stories. So many of you have heard me say it already, but um, that Jay Litvin um, of Hashem used, used to, or wrote up and said and shared it, that he um, he was invited. He, so he was he was sort of like the organizer of Chabad's initiative to the children of Chernobyl when the nuclear reactor, um, ex, um, I guess it doesn't explode. I guess it melts down a nuclear reactor in Chernobyl. In the 80s, I'm sure some of you probably remember. It was a big. It was it was a big deal at that time. They requested that Chabad go in and airlift the children out of Chernobyl so that they would have a chance to um, to grow up healthy, basically. Um, so there were many, many, many um, chartered planes, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of children. I don't know the exact number. Jewish children were taken out of Chernobyl and brought to Eretz Yisrael. Um, and the the government let let them do that because of the situation. They did not let them take the parents, or maybe they didn't have the resources or whatever. So the parents would sign off the children, would allow the would allow Chabad to take the children to Eretz Yisrael and basically raise them until they could join them. Which many parents did wind up, you know, eventually getting out and joining their children. Um, but but the danger to the children was much greater than the danger to the parents it was felt because their bodies were still developing and the the level of radiation was so intense that um they wanted to they, they, it was very very dangerous for children to be there and Chabad basically raised these children 
however old they were when they came on, you know, gave them education on food and clothing and schooling so that they could have jobs and marry them off, you know, until parents could come and, and sort of take over. So it was an, ama and it was an amazing initiative. Anyway, he sort of ran, uh, or ran part of it or organized it. And his name became kind of synonymous with children of Chernobyl. Um, and he, unfortunately, he died of cancer. Um, who knows, you know, kind of Mr. Snefesh, he went in and out of Chernobyl with these airless all the time. Um, and he writes about, he writes about many things. He's worth looking up about that org. He has many, many, his, his thoughts and he's very eloquent in the way that he expresses himself. And it's very, very meaningful what he shares. Uh, but one, one of his stories that he shared, this was I think before he got sick, was that he was invited to a, what's called a Sam Safer Tire, the Safer Tire is being completed. And there's uh, usually like a festivities, basically. It's like, it's like a, it's almost like a wedding. They bring the tower under a chuppah to the shul and, you know, put it into the arm with the other towers and they bring the other towers out to greet it. It's like a very festive time when his tower is finished. So there's a specific tower that was being finished and he was invited to partake in the party. And it was a very sort of like exclusive party. He had, it was by invitation only. It wasn't like open to the whole community and everybody could go and be part of this party. It was, um, it was exclusive, so you needed to have an invitation. So he had this invitation to go to Russia to be part of this party, and he's he, he said his his wife seems to have balanced him in many of his writings. He talks about her, um, and he writes how he said to his wife, "I wonder what I did to deserve, you know, feeling kind of good about himself. Um, this invitation to this exclusive CM Safer Tyra." So he says, you know, she always put him in his place. So she said to him, maybe it has nothing to do with something that you've done. You know, oh, you did something great. So you were, you were invited to this. Maybe it has nothing to do with something that you've done. Maybe it's in the merit of something that you're going to do in the future with this experience. So he said it like it switched his mind from thinking of like, oh, this is a reward for something good I did to like, oh, now I I have, as I said, if it's a privilege, it's like a responsibility, like I'm going and now I need to do something with that, with that experience for other people. And it's like shifted his mind. So um, really the, the previous rep is teaching us this uh, idea here, right? Where when he's saying it's not, he's not, he's not viewing that he is coming to America as a, as a reward for something. He's viewing that this is um, a mission right that if, if somebody is able to in this case leave war-torn europe um, and get to america it's because there's a there's a mission and he says it's a dual mission to american jewry and to their abanim and lay leaders and he's now addressing himself to their abanim that's the group that's talking to him right now so he's going to talk about the first mission and the second mission so the first mission Excuse me, Brother, yeah word you're using missilas I can't understand the word. Self-sacrifice. What's the word? Misirat nefesh, yeah. Limb, I can't oh, hear it. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, so the first mission is to urge them all to do whatever possible to sustain and save the Jews abroad from sinking. So, in other words, to help the Jews who are, who are still in the middle of war-torn Europe. Efforts have been made to be sure, and all praise to those who have been supporting the overseas terror institutions and my fund for the ransom of people who are trapped in Europe. Right? He's trying to get people out. He's trying to help the people who are there to be safe. However, all of this is still far from enough. Great, greater exertion is called for, as we only found out after the war how, how much greater exertion was really needed to save all these millions of people, unfortunately, who did not get saved. My dreadful experiences at the hands of the Assetia Inquisition do not compare with the unspeakable torments to which our Jewish brethren over there are being subjected. Um, that he's talking about in Russia, and that was pretty bad. If you read his, if you read his diaries, that was that was pretty terrible. But he's saying it doesn't compare to what's going on now, as as from what was going on under Hitler. Himachshmai. Over there in the thick of the warfare, their spirits are so crushed by cruel bondage that they have no strength to cry out. 
I was there with them for three months and witnessed the horrendous situation in general and of Jews in particular. Intensified support must be energetically organized to provide food on the spot and to increase the possibilities for immigration. So that's the first thing, like the Jews in America should take the responsibility to, as much as possible to try to help the Jews in Europe. That's like his first message. The second mission, which divine providence has placed upon me is the furtherance of God-fearing Torah study and of kosher schooling. So again, he mentions that in the beginning as well, right? That he had the Sirius Nefesh self-sacrifice for this in Europe. And this is something that he is needing to continue here, right? God-fearing Torah study and kosher schooling means immediately on my arrival, a fund for the ransom of captives was founded. That's taking care of the first, you know, the first mission. And a yeshiva was established in the spirit of Tom Chetvimim in Lubavitch. I believe, if I remember correctly, the Friedrich Gabbard said he wasn't going to go to sleep in America until these two things were taken care of. I mean, like when he first arrived, he arrived in a wheelchair after a sea voyage. I'm saying, we're not talking about like luxurious accommodations on a plane, first class, you know, like it was not, it was very, and and he had his children still in Europe when he left. I was trying to get the Reverend Rebbe to know. He didn't, I don't know if he knew yet, but one of his children and her husbands were killed by the Nazis. I was like, you know, we don't, we don't know exactly. Um, so, but this is what he want. This is what he wanted to have happen. And this is what he did. These two missions, he did this right away as soon as coming to America. The devout Hasidic spirit of its, of its students of the Yeshiva Tom Chetzimah, which is the name of the Lubavitch Yeshiva chain, um, is also impacting the serious students of other Yeshivas, meaning this, these, it won't just be personal. The Lubavitch Yeshiva system won't just be personal for the students who are in that system, but they will also impact other students, other yeshiva systems. It, you know, they're, it will, they'll shine the light, I guess. You know, there'll be, there'll be a ripple effect. Um, this visit to Chicago and the vicinity has been strenuous, but I'm gratified to meet its rabbanim, householders, lay leaders, and shul presidents and in particular, the heads of the religious and charitable institutions that are conducted in the spirit of Torah. I would now be happy to hear a report of what has been done in the field of the observance of family purity and Shabbos. And I'm particularly interested to hear about the state of education provided by the local Talmud Torah schools. So now they don't have here, but now I guess each of the Rabbanim sort of gave the previous Rebbe a report of what they were doing and what initiatives they were involved in and what the state of affairs was for what they were for what they were doing. But do you notice the things that the previous Rebbe chooses are the observance of family purity, right? That's a that's a that's a that's a foundation of the Jewish home, Shabbos, foundation of the Jewish home, and education, also foundation of the Jewish home, right? Each of these things impacts not only one's own personal family, but the entire Jewish community and future generations. So these are the things that the Rebbe is asking for a report on, because we don't have the we don't have recorded what how long and what the rabbi said. But this is the next, this is the response after he hears all their reports, right? So look at the word. <laughs> look at the word. There is no need to dwell on the mournful impression left by the reports we have just heard. It's, 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 a, it's a sorry state, I guess, is what he's trying to say. A mournful impression. It's like, instead of, you know, it doesn't mince words. Like, this is, this is sad. What I just heard is sad. The situation is deplorable. <laughs> I did warn you that he wasn't going to. It's kind of say it like it was, <laughs> which is what he does all the time, right? Even greater cause for heartache is the fact that so little is being done for Torah and Yiddishkeit, despite the fact that the local Rabbanim enjoy respect, both because it is well-deserved, unlike the communities in which such respect is deserved but not received, 
and because your community is willing to listen. In addition, the local Yiddish press is ready to cooperate, I guess, maybe in like announcing things and things like that. I, I'm not sure. Or maybe to print tourist thoughts or I don't know what it, it's willing to cooperate with, but I guess it's, you know, publicity. In those days, that was publicity. There wasn't emails and, and newscasts and I don't, know, I don't know, whatever, I mean, podcasts and things like that. So I guess this was the way to, for publicity. The state of neglect is apparent in every aspect of Chicago's religious life. As one of the speakers expressed it just now, the Jewish street is in ruins and the Jewish homes are shattered. That statement is no mere figure of speech. Sadly, it is a vowed description of the state of affairs. Moreover, as the speakers themselves have said, the situation is deteriorating. So this, this concerned the previous Rebbe greatly. I'm sorry, Chai, what year, what year was this? 42. We had a vibrant, vibrant Jewish community on the West Side. I guess it wasn't vibrant enough for his standard. I guess not, but it was, it was, it was a huge, vibrant community. They had all kinds of stuff there. Uh, I've done, done so much research. Same he's talking specifically about Jewish schools, Jewish schools that gave, that gave full, you're gonna see what he has to say. Jewish schools, full from education, Shabbos, Tar Samashbacha. That's what he's talking about, those three things. I don't know if he's talking about people who identified as Jews and even went to Shul on Shabbos, but are they keeping Shabbos? Are they educating their children properly? Are they observing Tara Samish Bacha? Right. I don't know if people would know that. I don't know that. Right. I, just, no, I, don't, I don't know if anybody would have numbers, of, but that's what he asked them about, right? He wants to know family purity, Shabbos, and education. That's what he wants to know about. Those are the, That's what he's inquiring about. And I suppose that's what he's calling more in full impression. <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't there. This was before my time. <laughs> mine too. Mine too. <laughs> Barely, but mine too. Well, I, yeah. I don't know. Joni, you wanted to say something, Joni? Yeah, I just wanted to echo uh, what Malka said about the West Side uh, and mention that Albany Park um, also fits that description which is where I came from, which I'm having second thoughts now about boasting that I came from Albany. <laughs> Maybe well, that's something to brag about because it's Chicago. <laughs> well, keep in mind that the previous job had a very high standard, right? That he held himself to and other people to. Um, and that these are Rabbanim who are coming. So obviously there's a vibrant Jewish community because there are Rabbanim who are coming and the previous job was saying they are, um, they're being given the respect they deserve. So they're obviously doing something and there are people who are, and he called, he said that the, the city is, what is, um, is, uh, is, is a, a vessel, right? That's for receiving. I'm saying he, the community is willing to listen, right? The Brabantum get, enjoy respect and the community is willing to listen. He did say some very positive things about Chicago. It's just that whatever's going on is not enough or at the level that he would want it to be. That's all. He's not saying there's nothing happening. There, uh, there's this whole group of Rabbanim who are coming to meet him. So obviously something's happening. They're all either a rub and a shul or Talmud Torah or something, right? And, and, and interesting, and the community is willing to listen to their rabbis, right? So he's gonna say what should be done. Don't worry, he's not gonna hold back. <laughs> So, but, but yeah, I'm sure there were, I mean, there were lots of, okay, anyway, this is what he said. Um, but he said the speakers themselves said the situation is deteriorating. In other words, that's not from the rabbi, but that's from these rabbis who are saying that they're concerned too, and the situation is deteriorating. It could be, you know, that generation something, but maybe their children are sort of becoming American and starting to, you know, leave some of the Shabbos family purity Jewish education. I mean, we see that that's what happened, right? I'm saying it didn't just happen in Chicago, it happened all over America. Um, so he's just, he's mentioning that 
Like he's not. Remember the, I think it was the previous Rebbe himself who said in the Kutte de Burm, he said about other people you should, I'm trying, I'm trying to remember if I, I hope I say this properly. He said, um, you should look at them, it's not something like you should notice, you should look at them with their positive traits. There was another verb, I don't remember what the verb was, but like somehow look at them, look, you know, see them for their positive traits and not ignore their negative traits. That's how he put it. So I think that's what he's doing here. He's mentioning the positive and he's not ignoring the negative. It's not always an easy balance to figure out how to do that. But he's really showing us that it's the only way to get something done is to is to mention and see and, and relate and you know validate the positive and not ignore the negative because otherwise it just kind of creeps up and gets bigger, you know. Whatever. That's anyway, that's what I think he's saying. <laughs> um, anything else? Any other concerns or comments? I just wanted to say that I, for myself, I'm a product of that decline, you know, so thank God I'm able to learn now, but there's a huge gap and the gap ripples, you know, I, and that's, so we can, obviously, so many of us are in that situation, right, so he has a point that we can't deny, you know, it's sitting right in front of you and there's so many, right. So thank God we have these opportunities now. Right, right. But still, and a large it, part of it is due is due to the previous Rebbe. That's what I'm saying. Like he, yeah. he he tried to accomplish something which is still being accomplished. You know, all the proposed improvements that we have heard are no doubt worthwhile, and will God's and with God's help will upgrade Chicago's religious life. And I guess they discussed ideas, maybe they said, this is what's going on, this is what we're planning to do about it, I don't know. However, after all of that, those suggestions all deal with particulars, while the basic foundation on which everything depends is missing. Basically, the entire religious state of the Jewish people depends on the nature of the education and guidance provided by the Cheder, the Talmud Torah, and the Yeshiva. That was his big thrust was Jewish education. The fate of the entire Jewish people, whether for religious life or God forbid for the opposite, lies in the hands of the male and female malamdin, that means teachers, and of the principals and administrators of those institutions, and especially in the hands of their respective educational board, education boards. Look how quickly he found out there's education boards in America. I, I tend to doubt there were education boards in that's all. Um, one second. I'm sorry, just one second. Um, the future religious state, not only of their pupils, but in fact of the entire Jewish people depends on the ideological identity of those, of all those office holders. So the people who are teaching and running the institutions of, of education. That's really, that's really where the future of the Jewish people lies because how can anybody continue the legacy of the Jewish people if they don't know what it is? <laughs> so he's, I, I feel like the, the previous over here is really talking about children's educational institutions, but I think in other situations, like Rebbe would say, you know, children in years or in knowledge, right? It's like, it doesn't matter. Any kind of ed educational institution has to be educating properly, according to Torah, according to, you know. So what should be done? Matters of Torah education must be entrusted to the hands of unswervingly God-fearing people who have a proper conception of kosher education. So it's gonna say something quite strong. First of all, the educational scene must be cleared of unclean disbelievers. 
Educational boards should likewise be in the hands of God-fearing individuals who are willing and able to cleanse the Talmudar schools of the active impurity of faithless principals, teachers, and books. All of those will then be replaced in those schools and yeshivas by principals, teachers, and books that diffuse the light of faithful Yiddishkeit. If this is not done immediately and earnestly, the destruction will, God forbid, become even more intense. Meaning, it's impossible to learn Tyra from somebody who doesn't believe in Tyra and God. It's not an intellectual study. It's a godly study. So if a person doesn't believe in what he's teaching and doesn't like walk the walk, then how could he give it over to the next generation? It's, it's not possible. You know, it's like that famous vignette, which I don't know if it actually happened or it didn't happen, but it could have happened, right? It's a true story. Maybe that didn't happen. I, I don't know, but it's like, it could have happened, right? With the ethics professor, right? We quote that all the time, right? The ethics professor is seen jumping over the turnstile and the in the tube in London and they arrest him like you're the ethics professor at Oxford University how could you like not pay your fee on this what a dollar fee you know whatever it is in pounds and he says well my friend's a, the, the mathematics professor at Oxford University but he's not a triangle it's like I can teach ethics it doesn't mean I have to be ethical well if you're if you're teaching ethics in Oxford University and it's a subject Right, but that's not how we teach Tyra. We don't teach Tyra as a subject of intellectual understanding. We teach Tyra as a heritage that belongs to us and is our connection to Hashem and our soul and our mission in the world. So it's not, it's not just like an intellectual thing that we're trying to understand. It's something we're trying to incorporate into our lives. So how could we have a person who doesn't believe in God or doesn't keep Tyra Mitzvahs talk, teach about Tyra Mitzvahs, right? It, 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 it takes when we talk about the the first mimer in this book, right? Sensing the godliness in something. It 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 it, it does it takes the soul out of the whole thing, right? There's even a halacha that if an apikaris, if a if a denier of God writes a sefer Torah, you're supposed to burn it. Like you can't learn from a person who is a who's an apikaris, who's a who's a you know a denier of Hashem. Now. To become a denier of Hashem, person has to be on a pretty high level. So it, it can't just be somebody who's who doesn't have knowledge enough to, you know, they like the the famous story of somebody say, you know, somebody comes to the rabbi and says, oh, I don't believe in God. I've been, I'm an apikaris, and the rabbi says, oh, really? How much chumash have you learned? He said nothing. Oh, how much prophets have you learned? Nothing. How much Talmud have you learned? Nothing. How much medrash have you learned? Nothing. How much Code of Jewish law, have you learned nothing? He said, you're not, you're not an atheist, you're an ignoramus, right? Can't, we can't, so it, you have to be at a pretty high level to be an atheist, a halachic atheist. But the point is that, that a person who doesn't believe in God is not the person who should be teaching. You know, even in universities, they have, they have non-Jews or even teaching, you know, Torah, Torah ideas or something like that. It, it doesn't go, it doesn't match. You know, it's not, it's not, it, it, it doesn't go together. So here, the previous time was like sort of saying that outright, right? I don't know who the teachers were. I know my husband has been asked to come and speak to different Talmud Torahs, you know, over the years. They call a Chabad rabbi and they ask him to come and talk about Hasidim or something like that, right? And he's gone to Talmud Torahs today, even that have non-Jewish teachers teaching in the Talmud Torah, like that's his teaching. So it's not like it's even just a thing of the past. It's that's why she needed someone Jewish to come and talk about whatever they had to, you know, talk about. Well, it happens, unfortunately. So this is what the previous was saying. Like, don't that's that if that happens, it's going to affect the next generations because they're not getting they're not getting the full Tyra. They're getting whatever they're getting, but it's not. Rabbis should explain the sorry state of education to their congregants explicitly. They should warn parents that the principals and teachers who desecrate Shabbos are leading their school children to an active rejection of the faith. You, Rabbanim, bear full responsibility for the current state of education. <laughs> it doesn't mince words. <laughs> Realize that every victim of the local schooling scene, every boy or girl who ends up with the missionaries was sacrificed by your neglect and petty politicking with regard to that scene. 
as we say amongst chassid, and when a, when, a, when a rebbe delivers such a message to a chassid, we say, ouch. <laughs> like, that's a... Rabbanim, take firm hold of the controls and fulfill your rabbinic duties with all the power that the Torah has granted you. So that is what he has to say to the Rabbanim. I don't know if that's, uh, I don't know if anybody wants to say questions, or I mean, I think it's pretty clear, pretty clear but it's a little harsh or firm, I should say. Um, but he turned over a city, he touched the city's soul, he did accomplish. You look at Chicago now, I think it is a very different city than it was. 1942, even though, right, there was Jewish life. It sounds to me like um, the evolution of the reform movement. You're saying what he was describing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could be. Uh, Could be. It's pretty much been the trajectory from then until present. Well, he, call, he called it, right? He called it. He said, like, well, he nailed it. <laughs> he nailed it. Yep. Yep. That's exactly the way it has unfolded. Exactly. Totally nailed it. Sadly. Okay. Any, well, we see, Baruch Hashem, there's been a lot of you know, turning, turning back to our forward to authentic tyrant of, and, and learning and so on. And that's Baruch Hashem. I think it's a large part due to what the previous Rebbe and the Rebbe and, you know, put sort of into the world was the opportunity for every Jew to be able to learn authentic Torah. That's like a huge, huge thing. Anyway, any, anything else or should we? Yeah, um, I, I have some a comment. Of, I mean, it's odd. You know, I was a public school teacher. So it, there's the same kind of upheaval in the public schools today in America. I mean, I don't want to get political, but there is an upheaval no matter what side you're on. It's oh, very oh, similar. Go ahead, go ahead. And, huh? No, I said, okay, go ahead, get political. <laughs> okay. Well, no, 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 uh, no, I, I don't want to. It's just happening. And, you know, I like in the New York City public schools, I know that ethics and everything was just thrown out of the window slowly. They used to teach classes in ethics and behavior and things like that. And it was slowly disintegrated until it's not there anymore. And now it's a total upheaval, I think. You know, the Rebbe in, in the 1980s, um, I, don't, I don't have the exact date and I don't know, the, I, don't, I can't tell you the very first time the Rebbe spoke about this, but I know that like when I was a teenager, um, the Rebbe was speaking about this idea of what's called a moment of silence um, and talked about, how, you know, Jews were very against um, teaching religion in the public schools because they were, you know, they're just very close to after World War II and, and you know, people didn't want to have, um, you know, religion and, and people didn't want to have religion taught in a Christian, it's a Christian country, you know, in a Christian way in the public schools. And so Jews were very wary. There ever came out with this like initiative, I guess you could call it, of um, a moment of silence, which he, he tried to, it was passed in different states and things like that, and really had lots of people talk, uh, the Bible shows, talk to their, I don't know, aldermen, I don't know exactly who, you know, they had to speak to about this idea of putting a moment of silence in the schools, which um, there was a spoke, you can, you can, I'm sure you can, like, search on YouTube or on Chabad.org for moments of silence and, you know, videos of the Rebbe, and you can hear the Rebbe speak about it with such passion about the importance of educating children about the fact that there's a, the, the, the wording of the, the eye that sees and an ear that hears everything that's being done and children have to know that they're responsible and accountable to something higher than themselves and they can't just behave however they want to behave that there's like there's an eye that sees and an ear that hears and that 
this type of education will prevent crime, basically. And people were, there was lots of, there was upheavals about crime and all these, you know, that this, that this prevents young children from growing up to being delinquent and adults who are, you know, doing all these heinous crimes that were going on. Um, and talking about how a moment of silence and the instruction should be on the part of the school that every child should speak to their parent about what do they believe in, you know, what like, what is their understanding of God and the you know responsibility of of people you know to live moral lives that the children should speak to their parents at home so that accomplishes that children and parents are talking about God to each other so it helps to bridge the generation gap and this idea that parents are teaching their children what they believe in and that the children should be instructed by the teachers in school to speak to their parents. The, the teachers are not to instruct them in what, in what to think about in that minute, but the children should speak to their parents. The parents should instruct them what they believe in. And that moment of silence is for the child to reflect on what the parents told them is the values of their family. And there should be no like teaching of what to think about on the part of the school. Rather, the school should tell them that whatever your parents told you, your family thinks about that. that's what you should think about in this moment of silence but to have a moment of silence for you know i, I guess to, in today's lingo you call it maybe mindful meditation or reflection or something like that like to reconnect to the the you know what their roots are and that and that and that for that moment if a child knows that they're beginning their day every day by thinking about their understanding of god and their family's culture it will keep them focused and accountable and feeling like they you know have a relationship with god and that they're accountable for to for their behavior and the whole their whole way that they grow up will be completely different and they try to get this past this moment of silent past in as many public schools as possible um and it, accom it accomplished a, a, you know layers and layers of things right like we we're saying accomplishes that the child and the parent are talking about education values it accomplishes that the school is supporting values education without saying what that what that value is and what that education is which could create a problem you know when you have a christian teacher in a jewish class or a jewish teacher with christian class like it's 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 not that the teacher is saying what to believe in but that the parents are instructing that the child thinks on their own for that moment of silence so I don't know, that's what that what we were talking about, Carolyn, just reminded me of that idea, like that kind of takes care of a whole slew of potential issues. It prevents them from happening, really. And it did happen. They did have a moment of silence. Yeah. I remember it distinctly. Yeah, yeah. many, for a while. many schools did, right. yes. Many. Yes. Because I've also heard from moving here in the Midwest, people said that different places in the Midwest definitely had it. And I know some schools in New York City did too. Yeah. New York was a but big, it, I, New York, I mean, New York, a lot of people in New York probably heard there was himself speaking about it. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, but then it dissipated and it disappeared. We probably need it back. It's a shame. Mm -hmm. We probably yeah. need it back. Yes. I don't know. Any, anybody else? I think that um, where, when I was raising my kids, there was a problem in the town that I, I mean, I think it's common and I'm not criticizing because I, I wasn't equipped to teach it, to teach Hebrew school. So I'm not criticizing the person who volunteered to do it because, but there was, the Hebrew school was run so poorly and there was no spirit there. It was, I, I made the decision to not put them in the formal Hebrew school, but to live as much of a Jewish life as that I knew and make it a positive experience and teach them what the spirit is and talk about God and Hashem's influence on us as a family and Torah and things like that, because so many people, so many of the kids of my friends, and we were all talking about it, were quickly, like their, their, 
joy and serving Hashem was being extinguished in this Hebrew school. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, ah, they're not learning anything. It was a negative point that was pulling them away from our, you know, from our halacha. So it wasn't neutral. And it was a very tough decision to make. Um, and, and honestly, in, in my community, the Christian population was doing a very good job in increasing their numbers of youth who were really believing their traditions. And, and the contrast was immense. So I just think it's important to understand that you know, people might be doing their best and um, there's no dig on the teachers trying to manage something they don't know either. But I think there's a huge danger of it creating a, like a vehement rejection of the religion if it's presented in such a poor fashion. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, that, that is, that's a concern, right? That's, I think, exactly what the previous I was talking about here is that when you have people who are not representing God and Torah Mitzvahs in a proper way, I mean, he said that the children are prey for missionaries. That that's what they're you know they're prey for missionaries. I mean, that was that was a huge thing in in the eighties. Um, it's cult, true, cult and also and just rejection and, of the of Judaism, thinking yeah, it's a horrible look at what yeah. I had to suffer all these hours, and it doesn't make sense because it's not presented yeah. correctly. Yeah. So that I mean, there's a whole generation of people who left Yiddishkeit because of lots of negative experiences that they talk about well look who knows every soul has its journey you know but i think our job is like you said is not we 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 have to do what, whatever we can to help and i think you know people do the best they can um with the tools they have um and at the same time i think what the previous was saying here is that he's talking to the leadership in chicago and saying you need to do something because they for, but there's two prerequisites to that, right? They are respectable and people will listen. I don't know what he would have said if he felt the city wouldn't have listened. I don't know if it would have been different advice, right? But he said they are being given respect and that people are a vessel for listening. They're, they're a keili, they, 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 they're listening to their rabbis. So if those two things make it a situation, they're willing to listen, you have to do something. That's, I mean, I don't know, maybe he would have said exactly the same thing without that introduction, but he said that introduction. Um, and he put a lot of responsibility on them. I mean, the Torah puts a lot of responsibility as well, right? And um, and and still, it doesn't. It never absolves a person from their own personal responsibility, right? Like that's. Um, but the previous was speaking to the leaders. So when he speaks to the leaders, he's gonna tell them what their responsibility is. When he speaks to the people, he's gonna tell them what their responsibility is, right? What you know, it doesn't. None of us are like totally on our own, um, you know, but the point is that this, we, I guess, and, and really many times the previous service said everybody, every single Jew's responsibility is to Jewish education. Here he's talking to the, the Rabbanim, but he made it clear that every, every Jew has responsibility for Jewish, Jewish education because children need to grow up knowing about their, their, their Yiddishkeit, their, their Torah, their mitzvahs, their Hashem, you know, and we need to accomplish that as much as possible. And, and like we said, the Rebbe gave his life in, in, in Russia to do this, the underground yeshivas and, you know, at par I mean, the, in the yeshiva system, in the Chabad yeshiva system in Russia, literally the children didn't know their 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 Rebbe's names and the Rebbe didn't know their children, the children's names. So that if anybody was ca caught, captured, found, they couldn't say, they couldn't give names because they didn't know names. They didn't know each other's names. They knew each other by their first names only. And, and many times when they came to America years later, um, God willing, you know, whoever got to America, they, they found out each other's names there. So that if, you know, God forbid, KGB took people and, and, and tried to get, extract information out of them, they had no information to share. So it was literally on, you know, a peril to life that, 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 that there the pushed for Jewish education under communist rule, even though officially on the books, it was all legal, of course, because anybody could do anything that they wanted to do. But of course, that was not how it was. 
So here in America, the fact that he switched from like this land of having to do everything underground, secret, you know, and to hear this like open, inviting world, um, and just making a point like right, but there's also a danger with an open, inviting world, right? There's a, there's there's a there's a danger that people are just gonna just not even pay attention to either's kind of it's not being offered to them it's not even being offered to them you know they can just come into america and you know join america so he's saying remember like that look just just because thank god people don't have to give their life up to keep shabbos but they still need to keep shabbos you know let's teach them about shabbos let's teach them about you know all these things anyway yeah it's very emotional and and I and it and it's not over yet until Mashiach comes, right? Like we're still in that process of having to make sure that we and and really the responsibility is on each of us. It's not again, he's talking to the Rabbanim, but it's everybody's collective responsibility, right? It says all Jews are responsible for each other. So we are all some sort of inspiration or leadership or role model for somebody. So we all have that part that we need to be hope you know trying as much as we can to have the tools that we need to be a positive influence a positive role model you know welcoming and and you know as as it says about Avraham it says Avraham um was called Avraham I have the Avraham the one um the one who loves me God calls Avraham the one who loves me and the uh, um I think it's the Rambam, but I'm not sure it says how, why, like, what does this phrase mean? Because Abraham makes my name beloved to other people. Like, that's how we, you know, when we love God, we make God beloved to other people. So our job in this world is not just to love God ourselves, but to help others to love God too, to make God beloved. That's, well, that's what we're here, what we're here to do. And even though it was short, I think it did take the whole class. So <laughs> we, we'll, we'll be able to, next week, we'll be able to start, God willing, the, the mimer. Well, hi, thank you for being that kind of teacher. Uh, well, you're welcome. I hope I am. I'm trying my best. <laughs>